welcome to Tomorrow's World Live. I'm Jen Gupta and I'm an astrophysicist and self-proclaimed space nerd. And I'm Hannah Critchlow. I'm a neuroscientist and a brain boffin. And this is a new and interactive show from the BBC in which you, uh, the audience, help us explore how science and technology is shaping the world around us and humankind right now. A few weeks ago, we were at the London Science Museum and we were investigating whether a human space race might be on the horizon. So, it, could we move to Mars anytime soon? If you're curious to know the answer to these questions, then you can watch the previous episode of Tomorrow's World Live on the BBC iPlayer. But tonight, over the next 40 minutes, we're going to be taking your questions on a topic that, like a trip to Mars, may sound very futuristic, but actually might be much closer than you think. We're going to be talking all things robots. Now, robots are increasingly becoming part of our daily lives, but where will it stop? Will they one day become our overlords? <laughs> and as we start to create increasingly complex robots, what does it tell us about ourselves being human and to be conscious? We'll be uh, uncovering these questions and many more with a panel of very, very brainy experts. Which brings us to you, the audience. Please do participate. We need you to get involved. So let us know your ideas, any questions that you have about the topic of robots. Uh, and you can do this you, under the comments section of Facebook or YouTube. And you can let us know your thoughts on social media using the hashtag MyTomorrow. But first, a huge welcome to the Manchester Science Festival and our lovely audience live here in the flesh at the Museum of Science and Industry. <laughs> You were going to mention the major robots exhibition that's here at the museum right now. Um, how we're going to be joined by a humanoid robot from the displays a bit later on. Hannah. Hannah. I'm Hannah. sorry, I'm sorry. I'm getting totally distracted by this little cutie here. I mean, look at the ears and the lights and the... Oh, the bottom. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, is it he or is it a she? I don't know. I mean, does a robot need a gender? Ooh. I will admit it is pretty cute. Uh, we seem to be getting ahead of ourselves and jumping in at the deep end with the big questions. Do robots need genders? I just don't know. Uh, to br to, let's bring someone on who may well have the answers to all of this. This little robot's creator, Professor Tony Prescott from the University of Sheffield to explain all. Uh, these are robots that are mirror robots and they are designed to be animal-like robot companions. Uh, we call this one Capek and this one Ada, uh, after well-known people in the world of robotics. And we've designed them based on an understanding of the mammalian brain, so we really are making something that's very approximately like a real animal. This robot through your company, Consequential Robotics, yeah. and you've kind of already mentioned that they're being designed as companion animals. Um, but what role do these robots play in your life? Have you formed an attachment? You've named them, so they're not it to you. We have quite a few of these robots now in Sheffield. Um, somebody mentioned that they look like rabbits and they seem to breed like rabbits. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we have to give them names so that we can tell them apart and also give them distinctive clothing like the scarf. But if you travel around with one of these robots, as I do, I took one to Japan, and you do form an attachment, and you do end up talking to it in your hotel room. So <laughs> do, do they have their own personalities? That's what... After a while, they do seem to... I mean, it's like if you have a car or a phone, it develops its own idiosyncrasies, and robots are the same, but they're a bit more like us, so we automatically project personality onto them. Do you, do you have a favourite out of the two of them? Oh, that's hard to say. Um, I, I've, 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 yes. I've, I've travelled more with this one, so we're kind of quite chummy. But, uh, you know, they're, they're all great. And what we aim to do is to make them more customisable in the future, so you can put things that you want into the robot. And have you learned anything unexpected from creating these robots? Well, as I said, we're trying to uh, understand the brain by building these robots. And so we've built what is a very simplified model of the, the mammalian brain, which is really also our brain, and put it in our, inside a robot. And it has an emotional system, so, or emotional in, in quotes, <laughs> uh, and uh, it can be sad and it can be happy and it can have low arousal or high arousal. 
And what makes it happy is, for instance, if you stroke it behind the ears there. Oh, uh, it's blushing. Uh, it's tail uh, it's, wagging. Its emotional state goes towards the happy end. And if I was to... eyelids just fluttered yeah. there. It was kind of like, oh. <laughs> if you were to shout at it or punch it on the nose, it would go red, which would be its angry state. And then, if nothing much is happening, it goes into a sleep mode. So I think we're learning about how the brain works because to the extent that we can model animal behaviour with our robot, we learn something about animals and even humans. OK, well, we'll be discussing the pros and the cons of building robots like these throughout the show. Um, all of you watching along live online are pretty lucky because we managed to persuade Tony to agree to be put to work for the rest of the show. We're going to be sending Tony backstage now to help answer your questions online. So you'll find him on Facebook and YouTube, poised and ready to answer your questions that we don't have time to put to the rest of the panel on stage. Thank you so much, Tony. And uh, do you mind actually leaving uh, <laughs> Catherine with us? Yes, I think yeah, we'll, we, we'll, we'll keep this one. We'll stay this here one. and help uh, run the show. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> very sweet. Very sweet. I'm loving that. So, something that I'm quite interested in is uh, what actually counts as a robot? Right, I mean, I think this definitely um, is a robot. I'm going to be taking this one home. You haven't laid claim, so I dibs. Oh, um, everyone dibs saw that, right? Dibs works. Yeah. But, uh, hang on a second. Won't your little uh, your dog get a bit jealous of this one? And that's a good point. My, my real dog, Ralphie, gets a little bit jealous, so he might think that Miro's a glorified dog toy. It might go a bit wrong. Or Miro might be a superior dog. I mean, Miro's not going to poo. You're not going to have to pick up Miro's excrement, right? <laughs> wow, we went straight there. Uh, so are you saying that you would prefer to have a robot pet than a kind of real pet? I don't know. I mean, I'm open to the idea. This one is pretty cute. Yeah, I mean, we, you mentioned just now, um, what is a robot? Um, so there's many things out there that you could consider a robot. Is my smartphone a robot? Is your smartphone a robot? That is a very good question. I mean, you can ask questions to your smartphone and you get a response. Yeah, my smartphone knows where I live without me ever telling it, which is a little bit creepy. Um, I can now just tell it to take me home and it will tell me the directions. That's kind of weird. So to help us answer that question, uh, we're joined by some more guests. So this is, for example, an image of what a robot looked like in the 20th century. But what does a robot look like now in the 21st century? So a big round of applause, please, to Dr. Simon Watson, who's from the University of Manchester. And he's joined by Dr. Sabine Howitt from the University of Bristol, where she is part of the Robotics Royal Society Machine Learning Group. Hello, Sabine, and welcome, and welcome to you. Sabine and Simon, hello. Sabine and Simon, welcome to Tomorrow's World Live. So I'm hoping that you can both help us to figure out the answer to our first question. Uh, what is a robot? And you've both brought robots with you. Uh, so let's start with you, Simon. And you've brought what looks like a giant metal spider. Um, what makes this a robot? It's a physical device that has some level of intelligence behind it. Okay. So it can act on its own accord, or I can program it to do something. So you don't have to be there with like a kind of control pad? I, I could around. be controlled. So if I was just controlling it on my own, that's a remote control vehicle. But if I put some intelligence, so I control it and it has sensors that mean it doesn't fall off the table, then it's getting towards being a robot. So, I mean, we were talking about cleaning up earlier in terms <laughs> of excrement. So is my dishwasher a robot? Yes. Is it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a look of maybe. <laughs> could be, yeah, no, it definitely could be. Okay. Um, you've got some, uh, some fancy little gizmos okay, just there. Just hold them up for us. Yeah. What's that, Sabine? So we have a thousand of these little robots at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory. They help us study swarming. So if you look at birds and ants, they can do all these beautiful, complex behaviors. And we take inspiration from those to engineer solutions for the real world. So we try to think about how we can make these robots work together. They can move around, they can communicate with their neighbors, they can sense their environment, and they can tell us what they're thinking by lighting up. So they have all the building blocks for swarming. Oh, fantastic. And is there a leader of the pack for the swarm? There's actually no leader. That's the beauty of it. It's really just every single robot following simple rules, looking at its local neighborhood, and the result is an emergent behavior, which, which is where the intelligence really lies. 
And how, so this leads to a kind of a relevant question. Yeah. How would you define a robot then? Oh, we have hours and hours of debate <laughs> about this at the robotics conferences. For me, it's something that can sense its environment, that has a physical presence in its environment so it can act on it, and has some level of intelligence so it can link those two things, the sensing and the acting. But there's no definitive answer of what it is. <sighs> there's, there's a lot of debate. And we, we only have 40 minutes, so we probably shouldn't get into that. So as much as I would love a definitive answer to what exactly a robot is, let's not get too hung up on definitions. That's a message to myself. Um, is it possible to draw a line somewhere, though? <laughs> you were talking earlier about whether my smartphone is a robot, because it can talk to me and I can talk back to it. Does, is that a robot? Either of you? It can be as well. I think <laughs> the key thing is it has to have a physical presence in the world. Um, so it has to be doing something to its outside world, and if it does that, then I think it's a robot. Simon, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think if it can sense its environment, if it can act in that environment, your smartphone tells you where you are and tells you where you need to go, I think that's a robot. Okay. I think, well, we're getting closer, possibly, to finding out what a robot is, uh, but let's start questioning the theme of robots by looking at a different direction. Uh, so we're going to welcome our next guest, who's Professor Andy Mia. He's from around the corner, the University of Salford. Now, he is part philosopher and part futurist. Uh, so like the he coolest... Job, job title, title ever. ever. <laughs> so he looks at how robots can impact our lives in the future and how they might shape future humanity. Welcome, Andy. Yeah. Hello. Andy, um, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Um, we're going to get into the topic of what roles robots might play in the future, but before we get on to that, let's rewind the clock back to the 1980s, and we're going to see a classic bit of archive from Tomorrow's World, and we should be about to see some footage that shows a robot that was, at the time, considered quite cutting edge. We to... Nothing appears to be happening. Let me introduce, first of all... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, God. And the opponent's back at it. He places the cue ball in the spot he wanted. It's on the yellow spot. Which ball is he going to pop? He's in for a big break. Takes the cue. A two-way cue and the red into the bottom pocket. <laughs> but it's not quite there. I was about to concede the frame here to this guy. It's amazing. This, I'm advising, is one of the wonderful things about live television. You set the thing up so that he's got to win the frame. He's bound to win the match. And even the, when he does decide to operate, he still can't put the red down. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is Hissing Sid. Goodbye, Hissing Sid. Wow, uh, that was some vintage technology from the Tomorrow's World archive in 1981. So 40 years ago, we were designing robots like Hissing Sid that will play pool. Uh, but how much have things moved on since then? Andy, what kinds of robots are we starting to see that will actually be like, useful parts of our lives? Well, I think it's fascinating that that example comes out of a kind of games or sport example, because over the last 10 years, we've seen, of course, robot wars flourish. It's not really kind of war, it's more like sport. And last year, I remember after the Rio Games, there was the world's first cyborg Olympics that took place in, in Switzerland. Can you believe? I'm sorry, what, what's the Cyber cyborg So these are essentially Olympics. prosthetic devices that are helping people walk and do all sorts of things. But increasingly, prosthetics are getting closer to robotics. And we're seeing this connection between physical and digital systems. And I think that's the future. So many more robot sports, many Olympics, I think, with sports and robots together. So by that, you're kind of meaning that I could like, have a robot arm and then go yeah, and play tennis or something? Absolutely. So okay. we think, I think, historically, robots are being separate from us. They're getting much closer to our bodies now, I think. Cool. And we've um, got some questions in already. Um, so Liz Threlfall from Manchester says, how soon will before we have household robots to cook and clean for us? We have a oh. lot already, don't we? I think <laughs> <laughs> they do quite a bit, I think, already. I think what we're getting to a point, though, is where we have every surface, every element of the kitchen is doing something. So you can have vacuum cleaners that suck air across the floor into corners. And I think already we see this kind of mechanisation of the, of the kitchen, but increasingly it's becoming a big part of every, every aspect of our lives, I think. So we're already there. Some of it's just too expensive, I think, at this point, but it's getting closer. The robot hoovers, anyone got a robot hoover? They're kind of okay, aren't they? But they're a bit you limited. Have a robot you have a <laughs> I did have one. I don't have the latest one, though. So oh. I need a little bit of an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got Christopher Nayash in the room, and he's asking how long bef before we see robots as part of our hospitals, so helping to treat us in healthcare. 
And Sabine, any thoughts on that? So in terms of treating, so I think the thing to remember is that all of our jobs are really the result of lots of different tasks. And what we're designing now are robots that are good at very specific tasks. So it could be that there's a task, for example, diagnostics based on a biopsy, which is something that we can start to use robots for. Uh, and a lot of that is still in the development phase. So it's still going to take time before we can see some of these robots doing specific tasks within, within a medical environment. But there's also a lot of work on the assistive living side, and I think there's really a lot where robots can help there, whether they're the Hoovers or other robots that can just help us yeah. in our daily lives. And that's, that might be cheaper than, for example, employing a nurse or a nursing assistant. Well, so the key thing here is because we're thinking of tasks and not jobs, people value the human touch, right? So they still want their caregiver, but they want their caregiver to actually have time to do the caregiving. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the way I see the robots in this context are really how can they help them go to the toilet, how can they help them clean up so that there's actually yes, more time for the person. Which leads us to what we see in the headlines quite commonly nowadays, which is that robots uh, are threatening to take over our jobs. And indeed, a recent report by the consultancy firm PricewaterhouseCooper estimated that something like 30% of current jobs in the UK are under threat from being taken over by robots. And if you go back in history, then the original word robot was derived by the um, Czech writer Kapek, who defined robota as, uh, as meaning um, kind of manual labourer. So there's always been these negative associations and etymology associated with robots. So that kind of brings me to the question, if I want to train myself in a career that will be future-proof, that won't be taken <laughs> over by a robot, then do you think that it, it should be a caring profession, for example? Or Simon, what, what would you say? Someone still has to build the robots. We're not at the stage of robots building robots, <laughs> programming robots, and having the intelligence to design their own robots. So somebody still needs to build them and program them in the next 20, 25, 30 years. So engineering, science, mathematics, technology, all of those will future-proof you uh, because somebody's got to build them. Andy. Well, I guess I thought, you know, if I had a pound for every time a scientist said we're still not at that stage, <laughs> I'd be a very rich person. And I think 30% is a conservative estimate, I think, actually. And um, even in, in hospitals, there was, I remember 10 years ago, there was Rudy the robot doctor that came around. And it was essentially a kind of iPad on wheels that would get around the hospital, but would allow some people to have presence and connection with a doctor, even if they're not there. And that was 10 years ago. So I think we're going to see a lot more jobs being up for grabs. And you kind of have to enter a new phase of evolution for me. You have to kind of evolve much more quickly, become much more adaptable. And that's the key skills I think we need to kind of get so that we can move with these very rapid changes. I also think we don't all need to be technologists. So there's going to be a lot of room in the future for people who are creative, people who do the caregiving, people who, who have empathy and who enjoy those types of jobs. You don't think that we're going to be able to create compassionate robots in the future? Well, I think it's also what do we want to create? What do we value? And people value compassionate people. Uh, and so I think we have the power to choose what robots do and don't do, uh, and we should choose that. So you're, you're quite optimistic um, about all of that? I am. <laughs> I'm absolutely <laughs> optimistic. Mm -hmm. And Sabine, you've shown us about your swarm robots uh, there that are uh, helping us find out about navigation. Uh, but I believe that you also work on robots that are on a much smaller scale, on the nano scale. Yep. So my team is interested in anything that works in huge numbers. Uh, and half of my, my lab works on nanoparticles for cancer treatment. And there the question is, how do you make trillions of nanoparticles work together so that they're more efficient, for example, at distributing over a tumor? Uh, so it's the same question. How do you design those individuals so that the swarm or the collective does what you want them and to do? What point are you at in that sort of research? Like, have you had any um, insight into how people might react to that? Like, would people be OK with having a swarm of robots kind of going inside them? So it's really interesting because there are already treatments that are nanoparticles. So think of them rather than robots. Think of them as, as more of the usual chemotherapy, but in a little bubble. And that little bubble is a vehicle that allows them to go to the tumor tissue. So to a certain extent, it allows us to be a little bit more intelligent in where these treatments currently go. And if you explain it that way, I think it's a little bit more helpful than thinking of robots <laughs> navigating through your body. All right, so no robots like just like kind of crawling. Not yet. Yeah, great. Um, so from jobs that humans can't do to jobs that humans wouldn't want to do, um, Simon, you've just come back from the Fukushima power plant site of that nuclear incident after the tsunami in 2011. 
and we're going to bring up some footage that you brought back of something you, you're developing with a company called Forth. So can you just talk us through what we're seeing here on the screen? So this is an underwater robot that we're developing and this is the non-radioactive test facility that's near Fukushima. And what we're trying to build are robots that can go where people can't and don't want to because it's too dangerous. So after the incident, um, there is radioactive fuel at the bottom of the reactors that has to be identified and removed so that it can be decommissioned in a safe manner. And we need to know where it is, what material it is, what size it is, and these robots are going in there to find that information so that we can plan that decommissioning process. And obviously a human would find it too dangerous to volunteer to go and do this themselves. Is that this is, correct? Yeah, so this is five metres underwater. I, how many people in the audience want to put on a diving suit and go swim next to some radioactive material? <laughs> No That's, takers? Uh, no hands up. No hands uh. up. So it, it, it's where humans can't go, physically can't go, or it's too dangerous to, to send a human. You could send somebody, but it's too dangerous. That's where we're trying to, to build robots to get into. And are these robots that are in development now or that are in use already? Because we have nuclear power plants. You know, How do we deal with this kind of thing without robots? So, we have a version of this that has been commercialised and it has been deployed at Sellafield to look at some of the facilities there as part of the decommissioning process. But mobile robots are very complex devices and there aren't a huge number of them in widespread use. Um, so we're just at that cusp of, of having the technology to be able to put robots into places that we've never been able to go before. Should we take some questions from the audience I now? Think better. Yeah. yeah. So there's a fantastic question that's come in from Jimmy Sogren, watching on Facebook, who's asking, who will own this type of workforce in the future? Oh, that's an excellent question. Who's going to own these robots that do all these jobs? Andy, have you got any thoughts? Wow, that's a really good question. I think partly because we see a major shift towards shared ownership of all sorts of properties. I've met a friend recently who has been working on a device that can help him treat his diabetes. And so we see a, a kind of groundswell of, of maker movements where people are trying to take ownership of technology and bypass some of the financial blocks that operate around big companies that limit innovation often. So I think we'll see a lot more of things like that and hopefully a lot more shared ownership too. Anyone else got any thoughts on, on who's going to own these? I mean, will, will, will the government own some of them? How will it, how will it work in hospitals? It'll be important to figure that out. So as part of the Royal Society's working group on machine learning, uh, one of the key take-homes from, from our survey of the public was they wanted to make sure that this technology benefited all, and it's not just the money uh, that might get concentrated into select companies, but it's also making sure that everyone has access to this technology. Uh, so who owns the workforce, I think, is going to be important, and making sure that everyone has access to it so they can benefit is, is something we need to figure out. Thank you very much, Sabine. So you're watching Tomorrow's World Live, where we're putting your questions about robots and how they might change our lives to our panel of top robotics experts. And we're live in Manchester as part of the Manchester Science Festival. More specifically, <laughs> we're here at the Museum of Science and Industry, where there's a major robots exhibition going on right now. And this is part of the Tomorrow's World season brought to you by the BBC and in partnership with some fantastic institutions such as the Royal Society, the Open University and the Welcome. And if you go to the BBC's Tomorrow's World website, you'll discover more about robots from our partners. For example, you can find out how Wellcome and the Open University are exploring the impact of technology and artificial intelligence on healthcare. Hannah, would you trust a robot therapist? A robot therapist? Hmm. hmm. Do you know what? Uh, I think I might. As really? we will be finding out later in this show, uh, robots are getting increasingly clever at reading our emotions and detecting them, and robots are able to analyse a vast amount of data, much more than we can, so maybe they would get a wider perspective on a problem. See, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I think I'd be okay with a robot doing like physical medicine on me, like a robot surgeon, but there's mm. something about a robot dealing with my mental health I'm not quite sure. Mm. not quite there yet. No. Um, we've also just got time to tell you about the new Tomorrow's World podcast. Yes, it's available right now and it will transport you into the future by asking some big, urgent questions facing us in our lifetimes. For example, episode one asks, could we one day meld our minds with machines? Check it out via your regular <laughs> podcast provider. <laughs> Definitely going to be checking that one out. Thanks to everyone who sent in their questions so far. Please do keep them coming in and we'll put them to our experts here on Tomorrow's World Live. You can reach us via the comments on Facebook and YouTube and don't forget to also get in touch on social media using the hashtag MyTomorrow. 
And also, we're lucky enough to have Professor Tony Prescott, Director of Sheffield Robotics and the creator of Wonderful Miro here. Uh, he's backstage, typing away, and he's answering any questions that you're putting in via Facebook and YouTube. So far tonight, we've talked about robots as part of the workforce, but could they also become part of home and family life as well? Could I have a robot friend one day? To help answer this, please welcome our final guest. First up, she works on the ethics and safety of artificial intelligence at the University of Liverpool. Please welcome Dr. Louise Dennis. And we're also very delighted to be able to welcome now a humanoid robot created by SoftBank Robotics uh, and he's here with his minder I suppose oh, yeah. Andy Jenkins from the Museum of Science and Industry welcome Andy and now hello hi Andy we won't shake your hand because uh, you've got your hands full I'm gonna say hello to this one as well hello now you are welcome it's oh. my pleasure <laughs> oh hi hi now I didn't realize we'd be hearing from you I'm not just a stage dressing, you know. Well, that's uh, me told. <laughs> Great. And Andy, I believe that you go into the local schools with now and uh, teach them about robotics, teach children now. That's correct, yes. I'm a STEM ambassador here in the, in the northwest region and we visited as we take uh, now, now into the schools and we've recently been to Disbury Royal Primary School where there's great interaction with the children, as you would imagine. So I hear that now can recognise faces, now certainly staring at me. I'm a little bit creeped out, there we go. Um, and I also hear that now is a bit of a mover as well. Can I get a high yes. five? High five. Down below. Two ah. <laughs> Just been left hanging by a robot? Uh, I'm going to get rid of you. <laughs> Andy and now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye bye now. <laughs> Didn't expect to fall out with a robot tonight, but there you go, just got owned. Um, Louise, how representative is now of where we are with artificial intelligence or AI? How close are we to having a meaningful conversation with a robot? We're quite a long way from having, I think, what most people would consider a meaningful conversation. As you saw with the now, it could have some very simple responses to some questions it basically knew were coming. <laughs> um, if you think more widely, we do have systems that can answer questions on very specific topics. But if you imagine when you sit down with your friends and you talk and the topics of conversation just go over a whole set of different things and you don't know necessarily where they're going in, in advance, that requires much more flexibility and we're not really close to anything that could have that kind of level of conversation with you. And what about in terms of emotions, reading emotions? So we're hearing about robots that can read emotions to some degree better than humans uh, and are being used to help those with autism, for example. Uh, so we've got a great question here from Alex Bushell in Man from Manchester, and he's in the room. And he's saying, will robots ever be able to have empathy themselves? Well, so that's partly a philosophical question. Um, I certainly think that maybe not soon, but at some point in the future, we will have robots which are able to mimic empathy very well. And so they're able to ask um, useful questions to help draw out what we're feeling and we'll be able to sympathise and say comforting things to us. And this is looking ahead quite a long way. Whether that actually means the robot itself is having empathy or it's just acting in a way that is useful for us to help us process our emotions is a, it's a very philosophical question. And it depends in part whether you think we are, as it were, entirely mechanistic creatures at some level, and so in theory anything we can do could be reproduced, or whether you think there is something um, mystical about <laughs> what makes us... Uh, and these questions are... are Almost impossible to answer. Certainly, as a scientist, these questions are almost impossible to answer. Well, I'm going to try to get Andy to answer a, a related question. Um, we've got a kind of follow-up question from Anna Trelfer from Manchester, who's in the room. Um, how do you program a robot to have feelings? Can you program a robot to have feelings? Well, so for a long time, we've had this big question around AI research, and, and as was mentioned about whether we can program everything. But if you, if I'm the robot, and Jenna, you're the 
person. You explain to me what you care about. And that enters my database. And then some situation arises where I see that may be frustrated. And I adjust my behavior because I know you care about that. Oh. Is that me being mechanistic or is that being empathetic in some way? I think it's the latter. I think empathy and all these things are simply us having a greater understanding of each other. And I think they're perfectly reducible to an algorithm. But that doesn't mean it takes the wonder out of life. And I think that's one of the big things to get across is that even if it's ultimately an algorithm that leads to us, our capacity to write poetry or make art, it's still wonderful. And so as we're now developing AI and robots based on what we know about our own neural networks and how we learn and remember and how we generate our own consciousness, for example, so can we actually generate a robot that has consciousness itself? And if so, should it have its own rights? And, sorry, I'm going to follow this up with another question from Adam Tuft in Manchester, who's actually in the room as well. Uh, can we, so kind of along similar lines, can we create a truly sentient AI? And will we be able to stop it from developing its own form of ethics that might be dangerous for us? Mm, good question. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> yeah, do you well, want to go for a <laughs> So there's a very famous thought experiment in AI, which is called the Chinese Room. Um, and so it, it, let's ask you to imagine that you have a room and there's someone sitting inside the room with a big book of rules. And um, someone outside the room who speaks Chinese feeds question into the room in Chinese. Um, and the person in the room is uh, someone from the UK or America. So they flick through the rules and they tell them how to react to the Chinese characters that come in and they send some Chinese characters out. And the person outside the room goes, oh my goodness, whoever's in this room can speak Chinese. Whereas the person inside the room is simply following a set of rules. And you can, it's a thought experiment, so there's a whole load of arguments about you know, how slowly or fast it's going to ha happen and how realistic this is of a model of how a computer works. But it's nevertheless quite a difficult argument to say how is, that, how is the person in the room actually understanding Chinese rather than understanding rules. Now, I personally think it means that we don't really know what we mean by understand or conscious or sentient, so that you can construct these kind of thought experiments um, that seem to become a reductio ad absurdum. They seem to just make a nonsense of the whole, whole idea that a machine could be intelligent. But there are some people who think it's a very powerful argument that a machine could never be conscious or could never understand because it's just following a set of rules. And even neural networks boil down to following a set of rules. And so, kind of switching tack to a different side of the, the ethics, um, we were talking, Sabine, about you know, um, robots in healthcare and that kind of thing. We've got a question from Rachel Breeze um, on Twitter saying, people will always want a human touch, especially in the caring industries. Um, do you agree? And kind of on a, on a similar um, kind, of, kind of train of thought, should robots start to look more and more like humans? This is one of the um, robots um, from the exhibition here at the Museum of Science and Industry. It's one called Kodomoroid, and it's designed to read global news reports in a variety of voices and languages. Um, do, do, what happens when robots can kind of deceive us um, to look like humans, you think? Could they touch Rather? in a way that may, may, would make us think that we're being touched by a, a human <laughs> instead of a robot as well? So rather than the faraway future where we're thinking of, of consciousness and, and robots being sentient, there's a whole range of real issues today. So does it make sense uh, to have a robot that looks in a very human-like way? Should we be making robot caregivers that can do all aspects of caring? And I'm quite encouraged that the robotics community has ve been very much on top of this by setting up a number of committees uh, across the world to think about robo-ethics and what we want these robots to do and not do. And the key thing we're learning is everything is context dependent. So it's very hard to put out a, a general guideline such as we don't want robots that take care of people because there's so many aspects in which it could be helpful. Um, so, so we heard before examples of, of kids with autism and actually having a robot that has human-like features and can interact in, a, in maybe a human-like way is a good, a good way for these kids uh, to start to interact with something that's human-like and allow them to interact then with more humans. Uh, so there is, there is really no general guideline, and every one of these systems makes sense in a specific context, and that's what we're trying to figure out as a community. So do you all think, I mean, I'm, we're putting this question to a panel of robot experts, so I'm guessing that the answer um, is going to be yes. Would you all be happy with you know, being cared for by a robot? Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a maybe. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I would be very happy, help, happy to have a robot that helps me in lots of different ways and then gives me more time to actually have, have a cup of tea with my, my grandchildren one day. That's actually an excellent question. You know, if we do get robots um, coming in and taking over some tasks, what tasks will that kind of free us up to do? Andy, you look like you're ready to answer this. Pounce on it. The answer to your question is compared to what? And, you know, we imagine having wonderful carers who love us and are so in tune with what we need that that's the ideal. But unfortunately, healthcare systems don't always deliver on those promises. And in the recent few months, the NHS has been, begun experimenting with an artificial intelligence app that allows you to have a chat with a robot as if it's a conversation a bit like the Turing test, where it will attempt to kind of make an initial diagnosis or recommendation, and then you go off and see a doctor probably. But nevertheless, the whole point of the, of the application is that it's better than phoning the triple one service because that's just awful for many people. And actually more people are comfortable with chatting than phoning these days. So I think the problem is, is partly that systems are inevitably kind of fallible and finding one that's better is, is ultimately what people want. And so if it's better as a robot, then yes. <laughs> just before we get on to um, our final question, Simon, can you sum up very quickly for us what the Turing test is? Andy mentioned that um, just now. It's whether or not you can believe that the the robot is a human okay so if you have if you have the conversation mm -hmm. could you tell whether it's a human or whether it's a robot that's answering you and we've got a great question here from mike trelfer in manchester so he's in the room and he's saying in warfare a human has to decide whether to fire a weapon or drop a bomb do you think an ai could or should ever make this decision louise so Simon, Simon and I were discussing this earlier, and we slightly disagree. Um, so, I mean, I, there are a group of academics who are very strongly opposed to the idea that um, we should ever delegate responsibility to a computational system to, to make a decision to kill somebody. Um, I don't have a kind of profound moral objection to it, but I know that um, people who do work in this er area are in general, actually very idealistic, and they hope that computational um, weapon systems will reduce the civilian casualties in war. So it's not like they're all kind of warmongers, yay, loads of explosions kind of people. I have a sort of doubt that you, you, don't, you don't win wars just by killing soldiers. So although I don't have a big moral objection, I don't feel this same belief that actually we will somehow have better, more ethical wars if we have computational weapons. So I know Simon has a subtly different... <laughs> so in any walk of environment, you, you train people to do jobs, so whether that's you, or, or activities. So whether it's to train someone to drive a car or train somebody to become a soldier, you train them to adhere to a set of rules and guidelines. And in stressful situations, you're not guaranteed as to what that outcome will be. Um, whether you veer and crash the car, whether you shoot an innocent civilian. With robotic systems, they're almost held to a higher, a higher set of ideals. Before they're released into the wild, as it were, they have to be tested repeatedly again and again and verified and validated that under all conceivable or, or most conceivable outcomes, they will follow their programming and they will, they will come to an outcome. So, people operating these programs, aren't there? There are people writing those programs, but not necessarily operating them. So if you have uh, a self-driving car and you've got that, the trolley test of do you hit the nun or do you hit the baby, um, you don't know what, any of you, you, don't, you won't know what the answer will be until you are in that situation. But with a robot, the idea is that you understand which, what that is going one? to be. Which one would you program in? <laughs> so in that case, what's the right answer? Depends on your ethical framework. <laughs> uh, and and this is, so there's a huge debate to be had about the ethical frameworks that underpin these robots. But when that incident occurs, you will know what the outcome is going to be. You can predict what that outcome will be. With humans, we have ethical frameworks, but we don't know what everybody's is, and we don't know when you get to that scenario, what is it that you're going to do, or is it going to be different to the person next to you? 
So the person that's writing these frameworks is in a very powerful position, aren't they? Yes. Right. Oh, well, we're <laughs> nearly out of time here on Tomorrow's World Live at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, but we can still squeeze in at least one more question. So it's not too late. Please do keep them coming in. Before our final questions from the audience, uh, I want to put this question to the panel. As robots become an increasing part of our social and working lives, how do you think that they will shape uh, us as individuals and also us as a society. For example, uh, if we look back in history, I like doing that, uh, Socrates was quite concerned that the written word would have a big impact on us culturally, and he was right, it did. We're now looking at a digital age, and we can see, for example, certain bits of our brain growing, the bits of our brain that's responsible for our thumb movement, swiping left and sli swiping right, that's growing as we start using more and more uh, smartphones, for example. So how do you think robots might affect our brains, our behaviour, and how we behave as a society? Uh, Andy. I guess, yes, <laughs> I, I guess uh, robots have always been a kind of mirror of our humanity. They're sort of separate from us and we look at them as being different from us. But I think increasingly they're becoming closer to what we're able to do and sort of will compel us to evolve even more rapidly, to adopt different capacities. And we see already in biology and biotechnology how we're adopting new forms of capacity through this sort of innovation. So robots might get to the level, level of being human, humanly intelligent soon, but I think we'll move on as well. I think it'll, it'll sort of push us towards some degree of evolution even f faster. Okay, and um, Louise, from an ethical point of view, very quickly, how will living with robots change us? Well, I think, um, and Simon touched on this, the fact that if we want to have robots that behave ethically and are seen to behave ethically, we will actually have to think a lot harder about what we mean by ethical actions in general. And it will force us to make some of those things explicit, which at the moment we tend to just assume that this is what good people do and you know, good people are ethical. So you have this kind of circular feeling. So I think it may make us try and think a lot harder about actually uh, the difference between right and wrong, not just on the, the big questions like, you know, is it right to kill people? Most people agree on, but really subtle questions like um, if you have an elderly person who doesn't want to take their medicine, should you respect that choice or should you inform their next of kin or inform a healthcare practitioner that they're not doing that? And there's lots of and a lot of it is very context dependent and, and it will make us think because we need to let the robot know in advance what decisions are the right decisions to make in these situations. Okay, and our final um, comment from um, our audience. Um, Kath on YouTube says, um, carbon-based life will give way to silicon-based life. We are merely a stepping stone in evolution. Simon and Sabine, do you agree with that? How, how many of you have a robot at home that does something useful? We're counting a So there's two, yeah. or, two or three But one hands. is a robot. So I think we're at the stage where really what I'd like to see happen is robots being useful uh, in helping us in the way we work, in the way we live, and helping us explore entirely new frontiers. Uh, so we saw the nuclear robots, but you can think of robots in space. Uh, and, and I think those are the areas that we should be focusing on. Uh, we're, we're far from the evolution of human being robots. So we should all go out and get a vacuum robot. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, would you agree with that? We're still, still a way away from... Yeah, I think what robots will give us are options and opportunities. So it will allow us to do things that we can't do. The re robots won't be the solution for everything, but they will be there for those who want it. Uh, and, the, and if people want that human touch, there'll still be a role for that. It's not a, a robots will just take over and everybody must use them. It gives you that opportunity to have that robotic healthcare assistant, or you can have a human healthcare assistant, or in any walk of life. People don't have dishwashers, they like washing the pots themselves. <laughs> I don't know many of them, but they do. Um, you know, it, you're not forced to use technology, and you, robotics, you won't be forced to use it to buy it, but it's there as an enabler. Okay, and Andy. Well, I guess I've done a lot with drones over the last few years, and, and recently someone developed a drone that you could attach to your dog. And it <laughs> Where's he going with this? And on a, on a chilly morning when you just don't really fancy getting out of bed, you send it off with your drone. And I guess you kind of have to ask the question, well, what are these robots doing that enriches our lives? What are the sorts of lives we want to lead? And do they allow us to have that sort of experience or not? And the drone 
taking your dogs for a walk is a good example of how, well, maybe we kind of want to take our dogs for walks and maybe the robot's not useful here. But, uh, but who knows? I bet some people will do it. I mean, <laughs> I want to take my robot dog and my living dog on a walk together. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for here on Tomorrow's World Live. I've thoroughly enjoyed, uh, with our panel of wonderful guests here, exploring what a robot actually is, uh, how it is going to increasingly possibly start to impact on our daily lives, and also, by creating robots, uh, how that helps to inform us about what it means to be human. Although I still have no idea what a robot is. <laughs> Do you? I'm not entirely sure, no. And I also, from this conversation, I'm starting to think that maybe I'm part robot. Well, OK, uh, <laughs> moving on. If you joined us partway through the show, you can find the full video online. Just search for BBC Tomorrow's World, Me and My Robot. And also, please don't forget to join us in December when we'll be at the Glasgow Science Centre. We'll be exploring how technology and science is going to change our bodies and brains during our lifetime. So it's left to us to say thank you to all of our guests, human and non-human. Uh, <laughs> Sabine Howitt, Simon Watson, Andy Meir, Louise Dennis, Tony Prescott, Andy Jenkins now, the Hexpod, the Tiny Swarm Bot. And Miro. Yep, Miro. Um, are you going to uh, break it to Tony or shall I? Because I'm totally taking Miro home. I think I'm going to be taking Miro home. Can I call dibs? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe we should uh, continue this conversation later after the show. Good idea. And if you want to continue the conversation about robots, then please do via the BBC Tomorrow's World website. And you can also continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag MyTomorrow. But that's it from us here tonight. Thank you for joining us from all of us here at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. Goodbye. Woo!